we're getting sick. Is the aircon aircon too cold? Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope everybody's okay. If you, you know, if we need to change the aircon, please please do so. It's more important that people are healthy. <laughs> so okay. So um, let's have a look at the uh, uh, questions for tonight. And Venerable 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 Bikuni, if you want to add anything to what I say, you're more than welcome to to say to add as well. If you want to. Or if you want to say that I'm wrong or whatever, uh, I'm very happy to, <laughs> to hear from the bikunis as well. It's nice to hear from both sanghas. We have representatives of both the both the bikunis and the bikus, uh, so uh, uh, sometimes it's nice to hear more than one voice po possibly. Uh. So there was one question that I got from Alan just uh, a few days ago. He he got these things from uh, quoting various suttas, and the question was whether it is necessary to have jhanas to be stream entry, basically, that was the question. Uh, and I think, the personally, I must admit, I think the question really is, uh, I don't think it is so interesting personally, because uh, it is really about practicing the Eightfold Path, uh, yeah, at the end of the day. And as long as you're on that path, then eventually the insights will happen. And, uh, you know, the, the answer is never to stop practicing the Eightfold Path. So if you haven't got to the jhanas, well, you just keep on going. And if they happen, they happen. If they don't happen, they don't happen. Uh, so it's not a decision you make beforehand whether you should have the jhanas or not. You just practice that path uh, and things tend to happen. So it's more like a theoretical interest, I think, than a really practical one. Uh. So, uh <laughs> okay, good. Uh, that's good. Uh. <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, still, uh, let's have a look at the suttas that you have mentioned here. And one of them is called the uh, Nandiya Sutta. And this is from the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Sotapatti Sangyutta. Uh, and um, it's about the four factors of stream entry. Uh, and uh, uh, what is the kind of the paragraph 40? What is the most significant? Party. Uh, there are the four factors of stream entry, and they are these four factors are totally absent in an outsider. In other words, one who is a worldling, one who is a not an Aryan, yes, so one, someone who has not yet attained to stream entry. They don't have any of these four factors. Uh, and. Um, how does a noble disciple dwell negligently? So this is how he disciple does n n negligently. Uh, okay, so this is this is the crux of the sutta, I think. Here, Nandi, a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha. Thus, uh, the Blessed One is, uh, you know, the Buddha, the teacher of gods and humans. That thing we've talked about before, uh, the enlightened one, the Blessed One. Uh, uh, content with that confirmed confidence in the Buddha, he does not make further effort for solitude by day or for seclusion at night. Uh, when he thus dwells negligently, uh, uh, there is no gladness. When there's no gladness, there's no rapture. When there's no rapture, there's no tranquility. When there's no tranquility, he dwells in suffering. In other words, he does not have the su sukha that is necessary for samadhi. Uh, the mind of one who suffers uh, does not become stilled. Yeah, when the mind is not stilled, in other words, this is about samadhi and jhanas and all that, uh, phenomena do not become manifest. You don't have yata buddha nanadasana. Because phenomena do not become manifest, uh, he is reckoned as one who dwells negligently. More questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, right, so basically you're saying here that this person is a noble disciple, but he does not attain stillness. Yeah? But what, is, what you will notice there is that it says that because it does not uh, because he does not attain stillness, uh, ma ma phenomena do not become manifest. He does not see clearly. Yeah, that's what it says there. But obviously, at some pa point in the past, he has seen clearly. Huh? So, at some point in the past, uh, he, because that's the only way to become a stream mentor is to see clearly. Huh? So, at some point in the past, he would have attained that stillness. So, even though he's negligent now. Huh? In the past, at some point, he would have, attained, would have had to attain some kind of samadhi. So there has been a change in a way, in the way he, this person practices. Uh, and that, I think, is the crux of the problem uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, and then you have the other suttas uh, uh, that are about uh, fulfilling virtuous behavior and stillness, uh, not being fulfilled, etc. And this is uh, 
a well-known set of three things being fulfilled, the virtuous behavior being fulfilled, samadhi being fulfilled, or wisdom being fulfilled, or it can be partially fulfilled in various situations. So for the stream enter, it says that virtue is fulfilled and samadhi is only partially fulfilled. Yeah, But uh, remember that fulfillment here, it, uh, uh, fulfillment refers to does not necessarily refer to having samadhi once or twice. Uh, yeah, it means it can mean things like having access to samadhi at all times. Uh, and this is why the anagami is said to have fulfilled samadhi. And the reason is because for the anagami, there is no hindrance to samadhi anymore. You can sit down, you can attend samadhi at will. So that is presumably the meaning of fulfilling samadhi, is the ability to attend samadhi at will. Uh, but so uh, for the stream mentor, it is not so obvious. It takes more practice to attend samadhi, and that's why it is said to only be partially fulfilled. Uh. So it doesn't mean that you have never attained samadhi before. Uh. It just means that you uh, don't have the full access to it in the same way as the anagami and the arahat has. Uh. This is my understanding of, of those suttas, yeah? and this is how I would, w would regard that. Uh. So anyway, so... Um, uh, there you are. So I promise to answer this, and I fulfilled my promise at least. <laughs> Good. Uh, you want to say anything, Venerable, about samadhi and uh, and uh, and insight? Uh, or Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah. Not on, yeah. I, I, exactly. So you, so you have to. It's about how much samadhi you have and how far you have practiced it. And it, it, the stream mantra definitely must have some samadhi. We know that because this sutta says that samadhi leads to yatha buddhinanadasana. No samadhi does not lead to yatha buddhinanadasana. So some samadhi is uh, is a absolutely required. Uh, it's kind of the the level that is sometimes a bit uncertain. Uh, yeah. At least uh, first jhana, that's what he said, right? Mm. That's what you said. That's that's what also it looks like. That's what it looks like. It is, in yeah. In sutra and yeah. also in uh, Visuddhi Maka. Yeah. He said at least, you know, the <laughs> first jhana. Mm, mm. That's what it does look like on the suttas, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, so let us continue with these questions. Uh, uh, I have been meditating for years, uh, <laughs> and yet my progress is not even not even at jhana state. Uh, um, don't I don't think that I don't think that's quite the right way of putting it. Uh, not even remember the jhana stages are incredibly high. Uh, <coughs> if you get to jhana, you're almost enlightened already. Yeah, this is what people forget: is that jhana is very very close to awakening itself. Uh, so there's so much wonderful meditation to be had before you get to jhana. There's so much happiness, so much pity, so much gladness, so much sukha, so much tranquility, uh, so many things. Uh, so not even jhana is like saying, I'm not even an arahant yet. Uh, yeah, gee, I've been meditating for all these years, not even arahant yet. Uh, what's going on? Uh, I want to be an arahant by now. Uh, but uh, it's the wrong way of thinking about it. Uh, and I say that because uh, when you read the suttas, the way the Buddha talks about the jhana states, uh, he always puts them on the same level with the four stages of awakening. Yeah, Four stages of awakening and the four jhanas are all called uttari manusadama, means like states beyond the ordinary human experience. That's what it means. Alang arya nanadasana visesa, distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Uh, that, by the way, is very interesting because he calls the jhanas knowledge and vision. Yeah, 
distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. They are called knowledge and vision because when you have the jhanas, you actually have a lot of insight and vision coming with that. Uh, so in that sense, they are similar to insight. Yeah? So it's very interesting how these things are termed. They really, cannot really be separated fully. Yeah? So it's important to understand that um, jhanas are up there. They are called the footsteps of the Buddha in the uh, Chula Hatipadopama Sutta, Majjhimanikai 27, footsteps of the Buddha. They're called the happiness of awakening, uh, uh, Samboda Sukha. So the awakening of the, the happiness of the jhanas is roughly on the level of the happiness of awakening. That's what it's saying. Um, what else are they called? Uh, they're called the end of the world. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. The end of the world, that's where all the senses come to a stop. Uh, it's the end of the ordinary worldly experience. So never think of the, never say that you haven't reached the jhanas yet. Uh, it would be almost a miracle if you had reached the jhanas. Uh, yeah? The jhanas are incredibly profound. Uh, if you are enjoying your meditation, even a little bit, it's already wonderful. Uh, enjoy what you have, and the more you enjoy what you have already, the more content you are with that. Uh, the, uh, you will go much further in your meditation practice. Uh, if you think, I haven't got to jhanas yet, uh, if that's what you keep on thinking, you'll never get there. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's so slow. <laughs> Any tips to speed it up? My friend told me uh, to look into Dzogchen, uh, but he can't explain what it is. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Uh, Dzogchen is a a Tibetan way of practicing, uh, yeah, and it's a kind of a way of idea is to tap into non-dual awareness or selfless awareness or something like that. Uh, and uh, I would recommend you to stay with the early suttas. These are the most powerful, this is the most powerful path to awakening, uh, the path that is least uh, likely to delude you. Uh, it may very well that Dzogchen has some useful teachings, but uh, remember the, the Buddha is the one who is most likely, well, most likely to find the best teachings. Uh, if the path is slow, it is very unlikely it is because you have the wrong teachings, uh, but probably more likely because you aren't uh, um, you aren't applying them quite rightly in your own practice. This is far more likely to be the reason. Uh, so sometimes if we change too much, you move from one thing to another one, you go from one teacher to another one, and I see that happen very often, people kind of wandering around. It happens also with monks, they're not happy with this teacher, they go to another teacher, uh, and, uh, uh, and they kind of drift around as if the teacher makes all the difference. The teacher cannot make all that much difference because the teaching is essentially the same. Uh, yeah, Dzogchen too, in the end, probably is very similar in many ways to the Samatha Vipassana or just the ordinary Anapanasati that we have in, uh, in, in Theravada Buddhism. Yeah? So it is, all, it is all very similar to each other and I think you're far better off staying with this. So the reason why you're not succeeding, what you need to look at, remember, the Buddha always says that Satipatthana, Anapanasati, Samadhi is based on sila. Sila is the really the significant thing here. Yeah. So what you should look at is your sila. Huh? That is where the whole difference probably lies. Uh. So you need to ask yourself, uh, are you how perfect is your sila? Huh? Can you perfect it more? Uh? Remember that it is not just about avoiding the bad things, it's about doing the good things. Uh. Can you be more kind? Uh? How do you speak to people in your ordinary life? Uh, do you try to say little words of kindness to the people around you, to cheer them up? Uh, not in a stupid way in which they kind of use your kindness or anything like that, but in a genuinely kind way. Yeah, your family members. The family is a very, very good training ground because we are so close to each other. And because we are so close to each other, we sometimes we get on each other's nerves, yeah, because we are so close to each other. Yeah. And I know for myself what a good training ground the, the family is. Uh, so if you are able to be kind and generous and uh, uh, you know, speak kindly to your family members, wow, that is absolutely wonderful. That is probably the hardest thing of all. If you can do that, you can be kind, kind to pretty much everyone. Uh. Our family members, even though they are the people who are closest to us, uh, that in some ways we love the most, we are the most attached to, it is also the people, because of our habits, uh, actually where it is sometimes most difficult to be genuinely kind over long periods of time. Uh, it is one of the things that I remember was quite interesting to me when I looked at the Buddha's explanation of loving kindness within the monastic community. Uh, and the Buddha says that in the monastic community, uh, to have metta, first of all, should be in body and speech. 
and it should be to your fellow monastics. Yeah, and I, I thought, to my, why is it to my fellow monastics? You know, why, why should they have priority? And the reason is, I think, because if you have, first of all, if you have loving kindness to your fellow monastics, it means that monastic life becomes very pleasant. It enables you to practice meditation, yeah, because you have the right um, uh, circumstances within the monastic life. The Buddha says that wherever there is disharmony, meditation doesn't work anymore. The whole thing collapses because that disharmony creates a big hindrance at the very base. And for this reason, you have to have that harmony in the monastic life. But also, because the monastics are the people who are closest to you, because they are always around you, it's actually the people who are most difficult sometimes to have uh, metta towards. Even though they are generally wonderful people, people who are trying really hard, it's just like a family. They are close to you, and that is why it makes it hard. So if you can have met that towards your fellow monastics, you can have met that to everyone. Yeah, It's quite easy to, you know, I come to KL usually once a year, it's quite easy to be friendly with all of you because I only see you once a year. But if I met you every day, it might be different, right? <laughs> It's true, isn't it? Uh, because you see each other all the time, it creates a different feeling. Things are different. Uh, so, uh, so this is the uh, this is where you have to look, yeah, to the people who are closest to you, also to your fellows here at the BGF. Yeah, make sure that you have a good atmosphere at the BGF, uh, that you see the good qualities in each other. Remember that everyone who comes here are good people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. What's the point of coming here if you're bad? You're, by definition, you are good people. So remember that, yeah? Remember these are people who are trying, people who are on the path. They're going to make mistakes, that's okay. You forgive that, because the big picture is so great. So this is what you do. Train in kindness to the people around you, uh, the people who are closest to you. Be kind as much as you possibly can. Learn to think about people in a new way. Yeah, learn to see the good qualities in these people because there are so many good qualities uh, to be found in Buddhist organizations, uh, even probably in your family or your colleagues at work or whatever it is. There's lots of good qualities there. Uh, and as you f focus on that, uh, you can have more metta. And when there are negative qualities, uh, you learn to forgive because you understand we're also conditioned. It's almost impossible not to have some bad qualities. Uh. So this is what you have to do. Uh. And as you do that, you gradually, you change your whole outlook. I think sometimes the Buddhist path isn't really explained properly enough. These things are not really put in place. Sometimes you go on meditation retreat, uh, they whack you on a cushion and they say, watch the breath. Uh, but they don't really say anything about the importance of sila or the, you know, the importance of uh, changing your outlook and thinking about the world in different ways uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh. So focus on these things, yeah? get this right, and I can guarantee you it will be a massive support for your meditation practice. Uh, but you have to put effort into it. Uh, you cannot just put effort into sitting on your bottom and watching your breath. That's not going to be enough. Uh, you have to put effort in these other things. Uh. And then there is the outlook. Yeah, the outlook which affects your values, what is valuable to you. Uh, work on that outlook a little bit. I've just been talking a little bit about that today, the idea of right view, how to look at the world in such a way that it uh, fits with the Buddhist path. Uh, and as you do so, you find the refuge somewhere else. You turn away from the worldly phenomena and you turn towards the spiritual path. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is how you speed up the path. Uh, but you have to be really honest with yourself. Uh, we cannot, none of us can actually afford to hide our kind of uh, um, negative sides or negative things. If you try to hide your negative things from yourself uh, and you close your eyes to your, your negative uh, aspects, uh, then you will not be able to make this progress. You have to be brutally honest with yourself. Yeah? Okay, this is my problem. I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to try to change. Uh, and then you really have to change. It is hard to change. Uh, but it is incredibly worthwhile if you can do it, uh, because this is what allows you to make progress on the path. Uh, usually we uh, ask our friends and relatives to change, yeah? Oh, my husband, my wife, I want them to change. They are like this. But forget about changing anyone else. It's hard enough to change yourself. How can you demand a change from other people when it's so hard to change yourself? Uh? So that is my tip, and that is what I would say is going to eventually uh, give success in your meditation practice. Uh, 
and then keep on applying yourself and then uh, one day, bang, things are going to really happen here. Okay. Would you like to add anything, Honorable? Yeah. Well, I... <coughs> Testing. Testing. You know, from the practice, after Testing. you practice for a while, Testing. you can uh, <coughs> see how you react with the people. When you hear something, you know, when people see, say something negative, I, I don't think this thing works. <laughs> I think it's loud enough. So, from uh, my experience, when I first started uh, practicing, after a while, then I, I could see, you know, myself react to things differently. So, after you practice for a while, then you can see yourself how you react to what you don't like before and you know and after you practice for a while if you you know the, if your reaction is the uh, improve this means your your practice is on the right track right mm -hmm. yeah that's how i you know when i first started practicing after you know many months and i could see that i change my reaction changes mm -hmm. to things that i i i didn't like so that's how you can uh, wash yourself and see if you're on the uh, right track or not. What, what, how did your reaction change? Well, just like, you know, when a, a, I talk to someone and uh, uh, talk to a girl and she always, you know, uh, uh, talk back to me. <laughs> 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 and before, you know, I would get very angry. But I'm that after pr I that practice, I could see, you know, I was uh, spring up and then I just calm down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. without any, you know, yeah. Yeah. reaction, uh, exactly, yeah. get angry at her or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. Good, and, and this is exactly what the Buddha says. The Buddha says that you know you should look at how your mind changes over long periods of time. Are you more equanimous? Are you more at ease? Have you got more metta? Have you got less defilements and anger? And if you do, then you know that you're on the right track. And that's really how you measure whether these things are working. Yeah. So, I, uh, that's exactly, I, I will fully agree with that, yeah. Okay. So, let us move on to the next one. Uh, Uh, there is a story in the Mahayana tradition that a Bodhisattva claimed that he will remain in hell for as long as there are still beings reborn in the hell realm. Uh, it was claimed that this Bodhisattva wanted to ensure that no more beings will be reborn in the hell realm. Uh, is this Venerable <laughs> Mahamogalana? <laughs> oh, uh, um, I, I don't think so. I don't think you should take these kind of claims too seriously. Uh, uh, the idea that you will stay in hell for as long as there are beings reborn there means you will stay in hell forever. That's what it means. Uh, because there is no end to beings being reborn in hell realms. Uh, yeah? There is no such thing as all beings being freed from samsara. I, I don't think that's possible, because if that were possible, this would already have happened. Uh, yeah? Why? Because it has, there is no beginning to samsaric existence. So if these things were possible, it would alre already have happened. Uh, so these are kind of, I think, they're more like to be considered as skillful means to give rise to compassion. Uh, I will live in such a way as to be maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. That, I think, is what this is about. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is not helpful to be reborn in the hell realm, because in the hell realm you can't do very much, because you will just be like one of the hell beings, uh, and all you will do is you will suffer so much, uh, you can't do anything at all. Uh. Suffering will be so overwhelming. Uh, it's like saying, I will be reborn as an ant, so I can help the ants. Uh, but if you are reborn as an ant, you can't help very much, uh, because you will just be running around, uh, working incredibly hard, uh, and then you will die, and then you will do more of the same for a long time into the future. That's what ants do. They work really, really hard. Uh, you have to be pretty impressed with the ants. They carry enormous things and whatever. And they, but it's kind of pointless. Yeah? It's this pointless exercise in working incredibly hard, uh, and then some, uh, someone steps on you, and you're dead. Uh, that's the ant life, yeah? It's pretty, pretty dismal. Huh? So don't get reborn as an ant. 
don't get reborn in the hell realms. Uh, that is really the, uh, the right way of looking at this. Uh. So uh, these are stories, they're nice stories, but I don't think they should be taken literally here. They should be taken more as a metaphor for compassion and kindness uh, rather than as something that is literally happening here. And um, Venerable Mahamogalana, it is said in one of the uh, commentarial stories that he was reborn in, a, uh, in hell in the past because he had killed his parents. Uh, uh, and maybe so, but in his last life he, he didn't stay there forever, yeah? he didn't wait until the last person was uh, uh, kind of came out of hell because he came out of, he, he himself came out of hell and then he became an arahant. Uh, so it can't be him, yeah? it must be someone else he was talking about, or maybe it was talking about nobody, maybe it was a story, that's what I think is most likely here. Yeah. I hope you, if you're not happy with my answers, you're, uh, you're allowed not to be happy, don't have to be happy with my answers, yeah? Don't have to say sadhu, regardless of what I say. So please feel free to uh, I write another question tomorrow and say, and say, what? You can't say that. This is, you know, whatever. That's okay. You're allowed to ask again. Uh, don't have to be satisfied, because sometimes I may not even fully understand what you are uh, asking about. Uh, okay. Dear Ajahn, you mentioned that all the Chinese suttas were translated from the Pali Canon. How about the following sutta, the Heart Sutta and the Diamond Suttas? I didn't really mean that. That wasn't what I was trying to say. Uh, the Chinese Pali, the, not the Chinese Pali Canon, the, Ch the Chinese Canon is enormous. Yeah, it's very, very large. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of the Chinese uh, Canon is Mahayana Suttas and uh, uh, in commentaries and uh, uh, and all kind of things. I, I don't have. I, I don't actually even know what's in there, to be honest with you, because I have never studied it. But there's, the, you know, lots of Mahayana suttas in there. But there's a tiny section of the part of the Chinese uh, canon, chi Chinese Buddhist canon, which is called the Agama section, and that is the section uh, that is very similar to the Pali suttas. But you only have to look at the Agama section. It's very short. You can actually buy it in the shops. I actually bought a set of these when I was in KL. I was here in KL. A number of years ago, my brother, my brother used to live here. When is that? Ten years ago or something like that? And I came and he took me around and he said, well, is there anything you would like? And I said, I know about this one shop here in KL who sells the Agamas. Let's go and check it out. So we went to the shop and there they were on the shelf. And so my brother said, I'll buy them for you. So that's how I got, got hold of the Agamas in Chinese. And so we have them now at Bodhinyana Monastery here. But uh, we are lacking in Chinese readers, and most of the time they're just standing there on the shelf, yeah, and looking very nice. So that is what are the Agamas, only that section. And that includes some of the Vinayas, uh, and, some of, and also the four Nikayas and a few things. Uh, and it's actually slightly larger than the uh, Pali Canon. It's larger and more because it has Agamas from different schools. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, what that is about. So Heart Sutra and Diamond Sutra are not Agamas. They're not from the early suttas, so they are outside of that. Uh, the Heart Sutra, I don't know too much about these suttas, but the Heart Sutra is like a, a condensation, a short version of the Prajna Paramita Sutra, which are the very long Mahayana suttas, uh, and the Heart Sutra is a c kind of a condensation of that. Uh, the Diamond Sutra, I don't even know too much about the Diamond Sutra, so I can't really help you with that one, but they're not part of the Pali Canon. Where can I get the equivalent sutta uh, in Pali Canon for the above two Chinese suttas? Cannot. Cannot get them. It's impossible. Uh, don't exist. Uh, unless, some, unless you want to translate them into Pali. Would you like? You can do that if you like. You can translate them into Pali and then we, you will have them in Pali. Then you can read them in Pali. I have been arguing with friends that Mahayana suttas were not authentic and were wrongly translated. Sadhu times three here. Uh, <laughs> um, the Mahaya remember that uh, Buddhism is an evolution. Yeah, it is. Uh, so when new suttas come out, like the Mahayana suttas, uh, there will be a mixture of old ideas mixed with new ideas, uh, because new ideas always come from something that existed before. Uh, so they don't come in a vacuum. Uh, they are also based on the Buddhist traditions. Uh, so when you read the Mahayana Sutta, like the Prajna Paramita Sutta, it will a lot of the ideas in there will be equivalent to the ideas of early Buddhism, what you find in the Pali Canon. But there will be some ideas that are new, that are not equivalent or not compatible with early Buddhism. 
And there are other Mahayana suttas that are even are, are, are less compatible. Prajnaparamita is probably some of the earliest Mahayana suttas, uh, and the other ones came later on, like the Lotus Sutta is much later, uh, and uh, these will have less in common. Uh. So it is uh, good not to be too um, kind of, uh, you know, this is wrong, this is right. We don't really need to do that, uh, is to understand that there are good things everywhere, and even bad things everywhere. And one of the things to realize is that the Theravada school also has been through a lot of evolution. So although the four main Nikayas are the word of the Buddha, there's lots of things in the Theravada that is not the word of the Buddha, uh, like the Abhidhamma, like the Visuddhimagga, like the commentaries, like, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff is not also not the word of the Buddha. So all schools have a problem of being a mixture of the word of the Buddha and what is not the word of the Buddha. It is true in Mahayana, but it's also true in Theravada. So you need to focus in on those things that are early part of the, uh, uh, of the canon. Uh. And it's interesting, even some of the Mahayana teachers, the Mahayana monks, uh, the very famous Taiwanese monk called Master Yin Shun. Uh. Have you heard about Master Yin Shun? Uh? Yeah? Very famous. And he was one of those, he was basically uh, one of the people who helped start so the, the large schools of uh, Mahayana Buddhism that exist in Taiwan today, like Fo Guan Shan. Uh, he was the inspiration behind Fo Guan Shan. Uh, and the Dharma Drum uh, School, another one of the big ones, and also Su Chi Foundation. Uh, he was involved in all of those, and he was a much of an inspiration in all of those, because he was such an incredibly famous monk and very highly revered scholar in uh, Japan. He was born in China, and then he eventually went to Japan during the revolution and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, he says, and he, s or he said, uh, while he was alive, he wrote books about this, that uh, the Agama Suttas uh, are the earliest part of Buddhism. Yeah, he ac accepted that. He, he was a Mahayana monk, so he also accepted the Mahayana suttas. Uh, but if you asked him what was the word of the Buddha, it was the Agama suttas. So this is actually known even in the Mahayana tradition. Even they accept that. The, g the ones who know what they're talking about, like Master Yin Shun, who was a very good scholar, uh, and uh, probably a very good meditator as well, I don't know, he, uh, he actually accepted that. Uh. So this is uh, interesting, yeah, because this kind of just shows that this is, if you do your studies properly, you come to the same conclusions. Uh, because it is not that difficult to come to those conclusions. Uh, because you can look at these scriptures from a historical perspective, how they have evolved and all these kind of things, uh, and then it becomes fairly clear what early Buddhism is about. Uh. So, um, uh, so it's good to have that perspective, uh, because uh, then we don't become too kind of fundamentalist. Yeah, just read the Pali, everything else is false, this is the only thing that is right. Uh, uh, it's good to have a be a little bit more kind of uh, flexible than that, because uh, the reality is always more, is always complex. Uh. Okay, so I hope that uh, helps. Uh, remember the Agamas are not really are not really Mahayana Buddhism. The Chinese Buddhist canon is not the Mahayana canon. The Chinese Buddhist canon is a mixture of early Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. If I may add. Please, please add. Uh, uh, Mahayana monk, Master Jiru, that he's coming in June or something. Yeah. And that the temple that we, we went to, uh, to spend the Vasa, Last master, what I think his temple, and he did uh, research about you know the uh, how how Buddhism uh, came from uh, India to China, mm. and he said uh, a, a lot a lot of uh, Buddhism a lot of teaching went from uh, India to China. Directly, not not you know coming this part of Asia. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> what he said. That so yeah. he said that that's why you know a lot of things are not in uh, Theravada yeah. uh, teaching, but I, it's in Mahayana teaching. That's what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so he yeah, he yeah, he yeah. he seemed to <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. believe that. Uh, he, the Mahayana teaching are more authentic than <laughs> 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. 
What, what, what is the name of this monk? <laughs> Master Jiru. 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 He's Jiru. Malaysian. Okay. Is it he's the coming here in June. Is it Chinese monk, is it? Yeah. No, he's Malaysian. Malaysian. He's Malaysian. Okay. He okay. was ordained yeah. in uh, Thai tradition in Tradition. Songkla uh, okay. for eight years. Eight years. I see. And yeah. then he changed to Mahayana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I, th I think it's it's pretty obvious that those suttas that are in common between the Chinese canon and the Pali, those are going to be the most original ones because they are in common between the different schools. They have the same source. They go back the furthest. Uh, yeah. So uh, and that's why how we can. That's one of the ways we can know which suttas are the most authentic ones. Uh, so I don't think you can say that the Chinese canon is more authentic than the Pali one. I think you just have to say those suttas we have in common are the most authentic ones. Uh, and n neither one is more authentic than the other. Okay. So, uh, Ajahn, Kamma is only one of the five Niyamas. Can you please explain the other uh, four, especially organic and inorganic ones? Thank you. Um, the idea of the Niyamas is found in the commentaries, it's not part of the suttas. The suttas don't talk about five Niyamas. What the suttas talk about, they talk about the different uh, reasons for uh, why we experience the world in the way we do. Uh, I think I mentioned that the other day, kamma is only one reason for why we feel the world as happy or suffering, but there are other reasons, like we get assaulted, or just we have illnesses, or the weather, the climate, or whatever, all of these things are reasons for how we experience the world uh, in terms of pain and pleasure. Uh, but the niyamas are commentarial. Uh, ideas. So I, I have never really uh, studied them very much, but they are like you know, like the physical physical laws. You know, the laws of the of the of how the physical world works, like physics, for example. Uh, world laws about the weather is part of this. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, so basically, they are more like the the, the external laws that ha don't have not non spiritual or non mental laws. Kama is a mental law about how the mind evolves. Uh, Whereas the other laws are really about how the uh, physical universe uh, evolves. Uh, there may be some more, there may be a chitta niyama as well, so a, a law about the mind which is more than kamma. But um, uh, uttu niyama is about the law of the seasons, uh, and uh, chitta niyama I think is the mental law, uh, maybe coming derived from abhidhamma perhaps to some extent, how various factors condition each other. Uh, and uh, but I, I cannot remember now off the top of my head what the what the five are because uh, again I haven't really studied this and I have never paid much attention to it uh, because it came from the commentaries. Uh, I can I'm, I'm pretty strict in trying to limit myself to the four nikayas because uh, there's enough to read already. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I reckon. I don't really want to kind of water down the uh, the teaching on the nikayas too much. Uh, so I apologize, that's all I can do. Is it okay? Yeah? <laughs> okay, very good. Do you want to answer that question about the niyamas? No? No? Don't know niyamas. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. But I think it's in the Abhidhamma, is it? I think it's in the commentary, sir. Is it? Not even Abhidhamma, yeah. Which commentary? Uh, which commentary? Uh, I can't even tell you that one. I, can't, I don't know. Not in uh, Maybe the city Maga? No. No? Okay, yeah. No. yeah. Okay. Some other commentary here. Yeah. Yeah. Y usually when people say Abhidhamma, they don't mean the Abhidhamma anyway. Usually they mean the commentary to the Abhidhamma. Huh? That's usually what they mean. Because huh? most of the information about the Abhidhamma is not in the Abhidhamma, it's in the commentaries to the Abhidhamma. Anyway. Okay. Venerable Ajahn, how about any good sutta for the contemplation of anatta in order to realize non-self? Uh, Thank you, Sadhu times three. Okay, so you want to realize non-self. That's good. At least you are you are ambitious, which is which is great. Uh, yeah, just you are you want to kind of do this all the way. Uh, but um, you don't. You know, remember the most important factor that you need for realizing non-self is actually samadhi. Samadhi is the most important thing. And if you come into samadhi with the right view, that is really where you have kind of a chance of realizing non-self. Uh, and uh, remember the way you do that, that was kind of a little bit how I explained this morning when I was talking about the Anapanasati Sutta. The way you do contemplate non-self is that you uh, come out of a state of samadhi, uh, 
you look back on those things, uh, these are things that have disappeared completely, the body, the five senses, the will, so many feelings, so much perceptions, uh, and all those things that have disappeared completely, uh, that you no longer have access to, uh, the very fact that you don't have access to them mean, means that they are non-self. This is how you see it, and it becomes so clear, so obvious. Yeah, you may not even understand exactly what I mean by this, because uh, it is not obvious, but it will be very absolutely obvious once you get into samadhi. You will have no choice, you will see it automatically. This is why the Buddha says that when you have samadhi, you have yata buddha nanadasana. You have no choice, you have to see things according to reality when you come out of samadhi. So this is uh, what happens. Yeah, you. Um, see these things automatically. So really, samadhi is the most important thing here. You can still contemplate anatta, and uh, the reason why you would want to contemplate non-self is to actually help you towards samadhi, because you see things as non-self, you see things in the right way. It means that uh, you let go more easily, because whatever is non-self is more easy to let go of. Often it is better to think in terms of impermanence and dukkha, because impermanence and dukkha, it is so obvious you don't want to have anything to do with it because it's unpleasant. Uh, anatta is a bit more difficult. Uh. But what I would uh, recommend you to look at is the sutta like the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the uh, characteristics of non-self, which is the second sutta the Buddha is supposed to have given to the five, his first five disciples. Uh, uh, first he gave the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, then he gave the Anatta Lakana Sutta, second one, which is found in, it is found in the Vinaya, it is also found in the Kanda Sangyuta, 22nd Sangyuta of the Sangyuta Nikaya, Sutta number 59, I think. I think it's 59, is that right? Yeah? Okay, got it right, okay. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> this is my, my, my Upatak, my Sutta Upatak sitting at the back, that's great. <laughs> so 59 of the Kanda Sangyuta, so, uh, so you go to Sangyuta Nikaya, 22nd Sangyuta, a Sangyuta is a collection, yeah, 22nd collection, Sutta number 59, you find it there, Anatalakana Sutta. You can also type in the discourse on the characteristics of non-self in Google, uh, and it probably come up straight away, because it's a very famous Sutta. This is one you can have a look at. Another Sutta that is very useful for understanding non-self is the, uh, is the um, what is it called, uh, the uh, uh, simile of the raft, uh, what is it called in Pali again? Uh, uh, I like to say the names in Pali, it sounds more professional. Uh. <laughs> uh, simile of the raft is the, um, uh, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter, it doesn't come to mind my, uh, right now. But simile of the raft is, is Majjhimanikaya number 22, uh, 22nd sutta of the Majjhimanikaya. And um, that is a very profound discourse on non-self. It gives you various kind of uh, ways of, of thinking about the idea of non-self, uh, and uh, it's very useful. But uh, sometimes these suttas end up being a little bit theoretical. It can be hard to really grasp, you know, how to apply them practically. Uh, uh, but uh, still, they may be worthwhile, uh, you know, reading just to kind of get a feeling for these things. Anatalakana Sutta is in many ways quite practical because in the Anatalakana Sutta, uh, there you see things like, you know, non-self means that you have no control over something. Uh, if you say, may my feelings be in this way, not in that way, of course that doesn't work. If, you, if we could say, may our feelings be in this way, not well, we will always choose pleasant feelings. Uh, you can't do that. Sometimes you suffer, yeah, sometimes you have pain. It's impossible to avoid. Can't have a life without pain. Always going to be painful feelings. Uh, uh, may my, kind of my body be like this? No, your body ages. Yeah, whether you want to or not, don't have any choice in the matter. Uh, so, and this is one of those uh, things that shows that control over something uh, is one of the characteristics of something being part of a self, or being under self-control. Uh, if you cannot control it, uh, then it is not a self. And this is, what, this is one of the reasons why you, when you go into a deep state of samadhi, and you cannot access something anymore, it's beyond your ability to experience or access, uh, that is how you know it is non-self, because uh, cannot control it anymore. Yeah. So those are two of the most famous suttas on uh, uh, non-self, but the idea of non-self is kind of scattered throughout. And of course then there is dependent origination, and you can use dependent origination to contemplate non-self, because the purpose of dependent origination is to show how 
Dukkha arises from ignorance, from avidya, uh, but through an entirely impersonal process uh, is there w w in which there is no permanent essence, uh, there is no self that uh, perpetuates the process of uh, dependent origination. So d thinking about dependent origination in the right way is also a nice way of contemplating non-self. Uh. But all of this is, uh, uh, use it if it is uh, useful for you. Uh. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't make it too much into an intellectual exercise. Sometimes Buddhists can get too intellectual, thinking too much about things, and uh, in the end, you, you, you think as much as you need to, to feel that you are content with the Dhamma, and you feel that you have enough to uh, give rise to faith and confidence, uh, but once you are happy with your understanding, then put the main effort into practice rather than intellectualization. The problem with intellectualization is that we end up arguing forever. Uh, because you never get absolutely sure until you become a stream mentor. And then someone will disagree with you, and then you have, a, have to argue with them, yeah? And then that argument detracts from the path so much. Uh, the more you argue with other people about the Dhamma, the less chances it is that you will be able to kind of feel peaceful and at ease and attain samadhi. So sometimes just be satisfied with what you know. Practice with that, uh, uh, otherwise you're going to argue forever. Uh, literally, you're going to die reborn next life, you can continue arguing. Why? Because you have the habit of arguing. Yeah? So once you get that habit, it becomes part of your personality. Yeah? I think of myself, I, I tend to be too argumentative. Uh, I sit some often next to Ajahn Brahm in a monastery and I start arguing with Ajahn Brahm. Uh, especially in the early days I used to do that. Uh, but then I, after a while I realized, why am I arguing so much? Shut up! And so I, and so I became more, qu more quiet after that. I argued less. Uh, and I was happy with my understanding of the Dhamma after a while, so I didn't really need to argue so much anyway. Yeah, yeah I used to argue a lot, uh -huh. <laughs> but no, no more. <laughs> and uh, no, I have a, a question. In psychology, they have a uh, ego, you know, the word ego. So the egolessness yeah. could be comparable to uh, non-self. Yes, yeah, it is a very. It is a lot that has a lot in common. Yeah. But uh, egolessness is much is more shallow. Non-self is much more profound. Uh, so, for example, if you have a deep state of samadhi, you you will feel that you have no ego anymore. It feels like the ego is completely gone. Uh, mm. But the sense of self is uh, the uh, anat you have still haven't realized anatta fully because anatta is more profound than that. Uh. So sometimes people think that you know you you get into a state of mindfulness, you have the kind of flow state where you have no, you don't really have a strong sense of self anymore. You're just flowing through the world. You don't really have a you know a, a kind of personal protection. ego, yeah, protection in the in the usual way. And some people think that is the understanding of non-self, but it isn't. That's only the beginning. Yeah, this is only getting to mindfulness. You have to go much deeper to understand non-self. Uh, and uh, and this is, I think, one of the um, uh, kind of one of the dangers of kind of a shallow understanding of Buddhism. Uh, most psychologists, you know, and philosophers around the world who deal with these issues will say that there is no self. You look at a human being, you can't see anything there which is permanent. Everything is always changing. Uh, but that is a shallow perception on the part of those psychologists. Uh, they are, it's true that they don't see anything permanent. But the weird thing is that even though they see that. Uh, those psychologists still have a sense of self. They haven't actually seen it fully, they've just seen something superficial. To be able for non-self to touch you in a deep way, uh, you, have to have, you have to sit through very, you have to have a samadhi experience, then you have to uh, look at your mind, and only then, when you see all five khandhas fully as impermanent, uh, only then will you have the insight into non-self. Uh, and that takes deep samadhi, uh, because seeing things like consciousness as non-self, uh, is incredibly profound. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. Microphone. Yeah. Microphone coming. Microphone coming. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello, Ajahn. Hello. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, pertaining to just some of the questions yeah. about uh, non-self, yeah. how to see non-self. Yeah. Um, here I would like to share my experience, Please, yeah. and hopefully this experience uh, can help our brothers and sisters. 
And also, uh, I want to uh, clarify certain um, certain things. Uh, this is about the uh, uh, how I say non-self uh, impermanence and suffering. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, I, last time, long time ago, I am really suffer yeah. because the mind uh, um, keep thinking, yeah. uh, cannot control. Especially <coughs> something that uh, someone that say something back, no, it's it's really suffer, no. So I continue practicing meditation. Okay, I uh, until um, I'm I'm practice mindfulness everything until the mind is just like observer. Mm. I mean observer, the mind don't have wandering thought. Okay, um, then after up from the meditation. Then, because the mind is clear and, 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 and at always at the present moment, yeah. and, I, and I realize that I can, uh, I, for example, uh, actually everything uh, is Sankara, uh, is the, the, is the Sankara working of Sankara, mm. because I can see the five gates very clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, actually we have no control about, about um, this cell, there's no cell, no, because uh, everything, everything condition arise. For example, when memory come out, okay, the sankara start making story ready. Mm. So, so uh, if you are not in, not in the meditation, you will say out already because actually what we say whatever is the sankara working on sankara already. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I see, I see. Um, so I, I, I mean, I mean. In order to see non-self, mm. you, you really have to uh, make the mind very calm, calm really, then as observer, yeah. then you are be able to see um, the, 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 a, a, everything arise. There is no one there. Mm. It's working of Sankara only. Mm. Okay, when the pain, when the pain come out, your mind reject, mm. not happy. But the pain gone, your mind is no more, not happy really. Okay, um, um, the consciousness, Last time you have memory that these things are very nice and you want to scrape it, you want to take. So, but once uh, you taste it, mm, it's not nice and you don't want it. So, there's no one there, no. Mm. It, it's ch it keeps changing, no. That's mm. impermanent. Mm. I mean, it's that keep changing. Good. So, yeah. if we follow all this, uh, we really suffer. I, I, I real, I, this is my, I, I, I understand it. It's really suffer, no. Mm. So, so, that's why um, I understand that, no. In order, to uh, stop this suffering, just like four normal truth, start understand four normal truth. So if you don't want to suffer, we have to be very mindful not to follow our mind, like or dislike. Mm. No. Absolutely. So, but yeah. even though I understand it, but I'm still, I'm still had feel that I still got myself, but I still, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still, yeah. have, I know I, I even I understand. Okay, I see all this, but I'm still. Have anger. I'm yeah. still no have uh, a craving. Want to have it? I'm still yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. Th one of the things that uh, that's good. That's that's wonderful, and that's uh, that's really great. And what you you know what to happen is in this situation is that you see non-self partly. Yeah. That's what you're saying. It doesn't mean that you have fully understood non-self yet, because it is a very profound idea. But you have seen a little bit of it. Uh, and every time you kind of you become mindful, and some of your ego disappears a little bit, uh, you understand a little bit about more non about non-self. Uh, every time you become peaceful in meditation, things fade away, the thoughts fade away. Every time, and just like you are saying there, uh, uh, you start to see non-self. You start to see how the process happens automatically without any input from a self. Yeah, it just goes on. Uh. So that's wonderful. But remember, it's a very profound thing, uh, and to fully see it, especially fully to understand consciousness as non-self. Is a, takes a lot of samadhi. It's not enough just to have a strong mindfulness or whatever. You need an incredibly powerful mind to be able to see this. Uh. So, uh, yeah. Good. Uh. Okay, thank you for your, your comment. Uh. Okay. Um, do you maybe one more question? I'm not going to go on too much longer. We can finish off the other questions maybe uh, tomorrow. We can always, at the on the last day, we can always do heaps of questions. That's usually usually a useful thing to do. So, dear Ajahn, regarding the eighth precept, uh, how does the Buddha define high and luxurious sleeping place? Uh, how do we apply it in today's context when having a bed is very common? Uh, 
secondly, why are males allowed to be ordained seven times at max? And why are females only allowed to be ordained once? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the, uh, how do we define a high or luxurious sleeping place? Uh, and it is very uh, hard to define. The way it is defined for the monks, for example, is that the bed can only have legs over a certain height. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be high because high is always a sign of luxury. A king sleeps on a very high bed. Uh, so this is uh, one way of defining it. But uh, if you sleep on a bench in like that is fastened to the wall, then it doesn't count anymore because it doesn't have legs. Yeah, it's a different thing here. Yeah. So, so this all, it all depends on, <laughs> depends on so many little things, how these things are defined. So really, what you should ask yourself is what feels right to you. Uh, when you sleep on something that is comfortable, you are at ease, you are relaxed, but it's not indulgent. That's really what it means. Uh, so if you... Uh, I must admit, I, did I have a mattress in there, it's pretty comfortable actually. Uh, is it indulgent? And, uh, it's probably okay. My mattress in my cutie in the monastery is much thinner, but uh, it's okay for a few days, and especially if you are just a guest somewhere, it is not, not an issue. <laughs> so don't be too concerned about that, uh, because uh, uh, one of the things, again, is that sometimes people get too ascetic. They want to kind of practice the path fully. And if you are too ascetic, you don't sleep properly at night. Uh, and if you don't sleep properly at night, there's no way your meditation is going to work during the, during the day. So make sure you are comfortable enough that you can sleep properly. Yeah. This is one of the most important things. Uh, and one of the nice things about going on retreat, if you have a good company and you have good people around you, very often you find you sleep much better than you do during the daily life when you're very busy because you can let go of some of the daily life. I know what I'm like, when I come back to my cute in Bodhinana Monastery, that's where I sleep the best. There's nowhere in the world I sleep better than that. I'm in the forest, completely by myself. It's complete stillness. Wow, I sleep like a baby. Is that right word? Uh, <laughs> I and uh, my babies actually don't sleep that well. They wake, wake up all the time, but I, s <laughs> I s sleep really well. And that's because you are withdrawn from the world. Uh, and it should be similar on a retreat. Make sure you sleep well. Sleep enough hours. Find that right middle way. Yeah, It is so important. Uh, uh, sometimes people get too zealous in the trying to practice the path in the right way. They go too far, and then actually it detracts from your ability. Everything should be the middle way here. Yeah. Sleep not too much, not too little. Just what is right. That maximizes your awareness, maximizes your wakefulness, uh, so you're able to uh, you know, watch the breath or whatever it is. Uh. That is really, that, that is what I would worry about if I were you. Don't worry too much about whether some th theoretical idea about what is luxurious or not. Uh, uh, something which is comfortable but not luxurious according to modern standards is good enough. Uh, would you agree with that, Wendable? Uh, or are, do you disagree strongly? Are you ha have It shouldn't be like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Those, you know, people that come and uh, take the egg precepts, so they know exactly, you know, what it should be. Yeah. Then, then, then they know questions mm. ah. So there you are. So that's two slightly different opinions already. <laughs> oh, it's never, it's never easy. Yeah, it's never kind of never get a straight answer in this life. That's that's what the terrible thing about about people always have different opinions. Uh, anyway, make sure you sleep well. Yeah, that's what I really recommend. It's important to sleep well. Uh, so as long as you sleep well, you, that is the right kind of bed, uh, in my opinion. Uh. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh. Uh, why are males allowed to be ordained seven times at the most? I don't, th I don't think there actually is a max of seven times in the suttas. There is a, a place where uh, someone was uh, ordained many times, uh, but I don't think actually that is, a, is an absolute maximum. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, po possible. I have need to look that up now because I can't remember this all that clearly. Uh, I think it is possible but I, uh, to be ordained more than that even, if necessary. Huh? But anyway, it's seven should be enough usually. If you haven't made up your mind after seven times, you, you have a serious problem. 
Females can only be ordained once, and I think that is actually not correct. That is a standard interpretation of the uh, uh, bhikkhuni vinya, that they can only be ordained once, but I think that actually is, a, according to my understanding, is a wrong interpretation. Uh, if you and the reason why is because the way it is phrased, I have actually translated all of this, so I know exactly what, what it looks like. Uh, so I the reason why it looks like that is because there is a one uh, case just before the one about ordaining again, uh, which says that if a bhikkhuni goes over to another sect in her robes, uh, and this is exactly the same thing for the monks, yeah? If you go over to no another sect in, in, in your robes, then if you come back, you cannot be ordained again. Uh, because you have, you know, it's almost like you have uh, breached your trust with the Sangha, that you're st keeping your robes and you go to another religion and you kind of, you know, you stay with them. Uh, then you can't be ordained again. And then just after that comes the case where a bhikkhuni disrobes or she goes back to the home life or whatever. And then it's, it is easy to take those two things as saying the same thing, but actually uh, it is not the same thing. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I, I think it is quite possible for a bhikkhuni to ordain also many times. Uh, if she leaves in the right way, in an appropriate way, uh, then uh, uh, I think there should be no issue. Uh, what do you think, uh, Venerable Uh Sri Lankan bhikkhuni? Yeah? Th they, they said that uh, only once. Mm. This, this, is, this is the standard understanding, yeah? yeah? But I I, I, I am, that's what they I'm heretical, you know? Huh? I'm a heretical monk, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't just follow the standards of everyone else. I kind of go my own way. That's the problem but with uh, me. Here. You know, when uh, uh. other Pikunis or people ask me, I said, well, you can ordain more than one. You agree with me? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there you are. Uh. Because I think that if you read the Vinaya, read that passage in the Vinaya, there's nothing really in that passage uh, right. which uh, says that you can only do it once. I think right. that is just an interpretation. The right. commentary interprets in that way, but the commentary is not the Buddha. So, uh, you know, you, s you start with the Vinaya, and then the commentary, you, it, you're not bound to follow the commentary here. Right. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay. <laughs> <You cannot. laughs> it's so again. <laughs> So, there is a few questions left. Uh, I will uh, un hopefully answer those uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, I think we will just leave them in there for now because we've been going for an hour already. Uh, so, uh, I order you to enjoy yourself. <laughs> Do you accept my order? Please keep on enjoying yourself. Uh, have a nice evening. I will just go back to my room just behind here and uh, do my things over here. And uh, have a nice night. Have a good rest. Sleep well. Yeah, don't forget that. Rest well. Uh, and then uh, uh, tomorrow morning we can continue. But before we do anything else, let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha together here. Yeah.